something that you may not know about me is that I love to listen to podcasts. Like, I am certainly an audio learner. I like to hear different speakers and different topics. I have a rhythm and a rotation that I will put things through on Mondays. I listen to the Voice of Genius, and sometimes I will deep dive on an Enneagram podcast. I'll listen to some NPR things. I'll listen to some theology and Bible things. I have some favorite authors that I'll listen to. I have a pop culture one that I go through, but um, I probably need a shirt that says, so I was listening to a podcast. Um, you know how there are those people that are like, you know, I was reading an article, and I just read this great book. I'm the podcast person that was like short attention span, but I'm going to get all of the meat out of it. But our um, even shorter attention span than our new favorite is David will just say, I saw a guy on TikTok. And, you know, and that means that there's some real good information that's going to come out after that. But I do want to tell you about a podcast episode that I have heard probably now five years ago. And it stung in with me so much so that every now and then I'll go back and I'll listen to this particular episode. It was a Radio Lab podcast, and it was all about trees. So to sum up, there was a family and in the forest, they were walking their dog, Jigs, and Jigs got stuck in an abandoned outhouse. And at that point, you'd be like, bye dog, right? <laughs> but no, they needed to figure out how to rescue him. So they are digging, um, trying to be able to reach the dog. And finally, when they're able to spot him, he hasn't actually fallen that far down, but he is neatly hammocked in this network of roots. And the little girl that was the daughter that this dog belonged to, it just embedded with her. Well, long story, she grows up, she ends up working in the forestry industry and she works for a timber company. Her work leads her to identify research that has to do with the trees and all of this, um, this these intertwined roots. And it's simply not just a visual tangle but that the trees are actually talking to each other. They're caring for each other. They're not simply like pine trees are talking to pine trees or ash trees are talking to ash trees, birch trees to birch trees, but because they're living together in the same environment, they share details and resources about the world that they're living in and each other. Well, how did they actually come to figure out this research? Um, well, you know, they took three trees, they took three different species, and they put them in a plastic bag. A full-grown tree. How do, I don't know how you figure that out, but they did. And then while the trees were isolated, they exposed them to an isotope, so that then that way they could, after the gas had been absorbed by the tree, they could then measure where was this isotope showing up in the rest of the forest. Well, that was shocking. They used a Geiger counter, and there was a tree five feet away, nine feet away, 11 feet away, 30 feet away. They mapped the trees, and these, again, are not just the same trees. They're talking, the isotopes are showing up all over the forest. One large tree was mapped to 47 other trees. This is in a plastic bag. So the forest is talking to each other. So scientists further identified that it's actually the trees were not the ones communicating. They were the beneficiaries of a fungus. <laughs> There's a fungus that grows on the outer bark of the roots. The fungus was spread through the forest and it, it would mine, this fungus will mine into the granite, take the minerals in that rock that it knows that the trees need it can sense what the trees need, goes to the rock to get those nutrients, and then brings it back to the trees to be able to nourish them. And this, so this vast network kept showing up, and they decided to do another experiment. So this time, instead of on top, above ground, they intentionally blocked off the roots of a tree so that it couldn't receive the communication that was coming from this root fungus. Um, and then they introduced stress to a different tree in the area. So then this tree would then signal to the others and it would give up 
its resources to the others to say, hey, something bad is coming. There's trauma. Spoiler alert, they like ripped all the needles off of this pine tree and they like exposed it to high heat. It was really mean, but. Um, so that tree is going to die and it gives up all of its resources. The ones around it flourish, except for the one that has been cut off. It did not receive that information. I geeked out at this podcast, and that is why I tell you that I go back and I listen to it regularly, because it's just phenomenal, right? How can we not look at this amazing planet and see the hand of a brilliant creator? The intelligent design of this planet will always amaze me. For the beauty of the earth, indeed, right? But I think that more so than just the creation, than just the intricacies of the science, I think that what resonated with me so greatly is because this is an image of the body of Christ. We are all part of this incredible network. As believers, we have spanned through time and across the globe to grow the church. That we have been sustained by the connectedness of God, the Father, and the Holy Spirit moving through all of us. And because of Jesus, we're part of this network. And when we're cut off and removed, isolated, we don't share in the benefit of the body of Christ. And so this is what I would like you to have in your mind as we go to the book of Romans. Now chapter 16, like I said before, it might feel a little bit awkward and like, well, what can we actually learn from this list of names that would help us in 2024 how to live our lives as better believers? It's kind of like when you go to the Old Testament and there's a list of genealogy. What can I actually learn to improve my faith there? But I do want to highlight a couple of things because in order to understand this, we have to also understand how the letter was written in the ancient world. So letters had a structure that was a little bit different than how you and I would write correspondence now. So they would sign their letter at the top and the audience for the letter would be written um, as, as well as like the main point. So at the beginning of Romans, Paul starts and he says, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. So that's the to whom it may concern type of a thing. Um, and he says, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's his main point. I'm just going to get right to the meat of this. I would like a refund. That's the main point, right? Like when you go to write a letter. Um, but then at the end of the letter, that's when you would do the, well, how so and so, and that, you know, the niceties, the things that you would do. And so that's exactly what Paul is doing here. He is giving his personal messages to individuals. Um, so we're going to dig into this. And the only other caveat that I have here is just a quick tip. If you ever have to read out loud scripture and there are names, just do it with confidence, like you know that person's name. So I am going to proceed as thus. If you have a different pronunciation, we do that. Um, so let's begin at uh, Romans 16, verse 1. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Crenshaw, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from you. For she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. Greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Greet also the, house, the church in their house. Greet my beloved Epaphnetus, who was the first convert to Christ in Asia. Greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. Greet Angelicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. They are well known to the apostles, and they were in Christ before me. Greet a pamphletus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my beloved Stinkies. Greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. Greet my kinsmen, Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Greet those workers in the Lord, Tryphenia and Tryphosa. Greet the beloved Persis, who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. Greet Asyncretitis, Phlegon, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermas, and the brothers who are with them. Greet Pliocolus, Julia, Neruus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. 
Greet one another with the holy kiss, and all the churches greet you. Now, this is a massive list of names. Also, verse 16, we tried to tell our youth pastor that this was biblical and that we should be allowed to kiss each other. Um, he did not buy that. Um, <laughs> but this, there is a lot of real people. These were real people that followed Jesus. And Paul knows them, and he knows them by name. So we're gonna we're gonna go through and highlight just a handful, just two, two or three. Um, but Phoebe, Phoebe is commended to the church at Rome. Not that Phoebe. Uh, okay. And we don't actually. That's not. That's not necessarily Phoebe. That is an ancient Roman woman. But she's a. She's what we have because um, we don't know a lot about Phoebe. But everything that we can glean here. Um, that's in scripture is from this passage, but there's a lot of church history and tradition about Phoebe, and so she is commended to the church at Rome, which means Paul is introducing her to Rome. She carried the letter. She brought the letter to the church at Rome. She's mentioned the word servant that I read where it says our servant Phoebe, um, that is the same word that is the word diakonos, which is the word for deacon. And so it's often translated as servant sometimes, but it really is the same that is throughout the New Testament for the word deacon. And so that is a minister or a leader in the church. She worked alongside of Paul and would have been trusted if she was carrying this letter. Also, her carrying this letter meant that she was likely well-to-do. She's listed as a patron, meaning she has funds to be able to support the church. She's a benefactor of the church and of Paul. Um, she likely could have hosted and supported the church at Crenshaw. It could have been hosted in her home. Paul could have actually lived with her for a time when he was there. Um, and so Rome does not know her, but she will likely stay on there, and perhaps it was her intention that she would ultimately welcome Paul because he mentions in other writings that he longs to be able to come to them. So that is Phoebe, Phoebe, who's carrying the letter and is there. Um, and then also the next is a couple. So now we're at the point where Paul is talking to the people that he does know. So Phoebe's there, but he wants to be able to say, also, greet Prisca and Aquila. So Prisca is short for Priscilla, so it's like a nickname, like Kathy for Catherine, um, or Peggy for Margaret. Um, but, so of the 28 people that Paul is going to mention, this is who he wants to say, tell Priscilla and Aquila I said hi. And they are mentioned six times throughout the New Testament. Um, the first time that they are mentioned in Acts 18 is when we actually meet them. It's the only time that they are mentioned with Aquila being listed first. All the other times they're listed as Priscilla and Aquila. Um, and so there's some things that we can infer from that, but the fact that they are mentioned in Acts 18, this is the introduction to a story where they actually go on and they pull Apollos aside and they counsel him. Him. So Acts 18 would be a great passage to read. You can see some of all of the travel and all of the heroic adventures that the early church was going through. But Paul meets them. They live together with Paul in Corinth for at least a year and a half. They're also tent makers. So by doing that and being tent makers, they um, host the church in Ephesus. They have a church that meets with them in Corinth. When they are introduced in, in Acts 18, they had come from Italy, and then they're in Corinth. They go to Crenche. We've heard that word before, so they may have known each other, Phoebe and Priscilla and Aquila. Then they end up in Ephesus. They go back to Rome, which is where Paul is writing to them now. So he's like, oh, my friends, we were together here. They're back in Rome. Say hi to them again. Maybe he's planning to come and be with them again. But no matter what, they have a strong leadership role. And so 
they are mirrors among the church, and Paul is indebted to them. They are his fellow servants and workers in the Lord. Do you have church friends like that? Someone that you lived and worshiped alongside, and then through life circumstances, you know, they're not part of your everyday life? When you read through scripture and names pop out, is it difficult for you to imagine that these people were real humans? We have a network just like the trees. The body of Christ is vast, and it has spanned through time and the globe to be able to connect and sustain the church. The local church, yes, but the global church is because of these people. There's a picture. Um, I'm actually wearing the same sweater. That was only a few weeks ago. Um, these are my really good friends, and we're um, in New York, but it's been about 15 years since we've all been together in a church. And now one of them is in California at a different church than the one that David mentioned that we were part of, and one is in Colorado, and I'm in Texas. Do you have people like that in your life? I've been part of four local churches throughout my life. Um, that is a picture of uh, Covina First Baptist, which became Christ First Baptist. That's the church where my parents were married. That's the church where David and I were married. And fun fact, that little painting was actually done by one of my former youth group students. And so um, I pulled that off of Instagram. But um, David and I, David's been part of each of the local churches that I was part of because where I grew up, I ended up coming back to work there after I had gone through school. But he counted, we think, 10 um, because of the way that his family moved around when he was younger and he went to church with his grandma and also with his parents. And so, but through the years, I'm sure you have a story too. Did you collect Priscilla's and Aquila's? Do you have dear friends in the Lord that you are now stitched together with? If I were to share my testimony with you, I can't say that on this day I became a believer because of this person. No, my testimony is because of this body of Christ that worships at 200 North 2nd Avenue. It's because of my family, too. But they shaped and molded me into a young person that knew God's word through VBS and through choir and through Sunday school and through dinners at so-and-so and through going to chicken lunch with my grandparents at Bojack's and sitting next to Dennis Cunning and Lordson. And, you know, the, it was the people. It was being surrounded by those people. And as I grew and matured in my faith, I was able to lead and minister in the same hallways that I walked through on a rope going to preschool chapel. <laughs> now, I know that I have a very darling story and that not everybody has that story. But I am indebted to it. I also have dear sisters in Christ that I met through my time at school. This is a picture of us having a uh, tea party in the dorms. I didn't live in the dorms, but I was a commuter, but I had a lot of friends through choir. And so, and then um, that tradition still goes on. Um, you can go to the next slide. So then now the woman that hosts it, she invites daughters. I didn't have a daughter, but I still, I'm at the end of that table. Some of those girls, um, one of those girls in that picture was in my wedding. Um, but these women are part of my network. And we were not part of a local church together, but they are certainly part of my root system. When we moved here, and when Declan was young, I was part of a mom's group. And some of those ladies um, that were part of the mom to mom group that I was a part of, they attended here. And some of them attended other churches as well. Um, but they're part of my group system. And as I've built a company in the wedding industry, I've met some other people who I know are solid believers, who are my brothers and sisters in Christ, and I know that one day we will be in heaven together at a great banquet table at the final wedding of the Lamb. But they are people that I see at networking events or we work together through um, different clients and jobs. So what about you? Where do you collect these roots? There's a graphic in your handout, and it has some roots and some lines. 
Who were the roots that led you to faith? Who were the people in your past or may are part of your current, but they're just not geographically in this room? Who are the people that if you were to write your letter and say, greet these people, we're going to take a moment. We're going to pray for them this morning because they're going to be worshiping in other churches around the country, around the globe. So um, Paul starts his letter in the Philippians by saying, I thank my God every time I remember you. So would you bow your heads? And take a few moments. Pray for those people that are near and dear to you. strengthen your church. Amen. When we are deeply connected to the body of Christ, we are held in that safety net, in those roots. Psalm 1 reads, Blessed is the one who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff that the wind drives away. And Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, he mentions that wind. And he says, he's talking about believers, and he says, they will no longer be like infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful schemes. When the roots are strong and we are connected to the body of Christ, the wind can't knock us over, right? This is the person this is the believer whose delight is in the word of the Lord. And John 1.1 1, 1 tells us Jesus is that word. He is that logos. He is the connection between us all. So for the last two weeks, as we've been going through Romans and looking at chapter 14, looking at chapter 15, the point that's been coming to the surface as Paul is wrapping up this letter is unity. And it is that the church should be unified. That we cannot allow issues to splinter us from the big picture. And the big picture for Paul is that he was called to evangelize to the Gentiles. That is his commissioning that Jesus called him to. And we are in this very room because God called Paul to mission to be a missionary to the Gentiles. Jerusalem is in that bottom right corner, and all of the Mediterranean became Paul's mission field. And that connection, and that system, and those tree roots went out, and they spread the gospel throughout that entire region. And starting, this book was likely written in about 57 AD, so when people still, the people alive still knew Jesus. So this is now spreading throughout their families and their generations. So we owe a debt to the very people mentioned in this chapter. They endured persecution. They were, and they were strong in face, in the face of a world that was not kind to them was not kind to Jesus. The church is a global entity because of that grace that is offered to us, and it wasn't just for the Jewish people. It wasn't just because God chose Abram, but he grafted us all in. It was for all people. And I don't know if I've ever 
heard somebody mention from a pulpit and talk about how it can feel hard when the people that you love don't sit in this room with you on a Sunday morning. When the people that you long to worship with are worshiping in another place, maybe. Maybe because of geography, or maybe because God called them to move and to minister in another place. Maybe their job relocated them. But the body is alive and it is ever changing, and that is the expansion of the gospel. We've been part of this church for 12 years. The people in this room are not the same folks that were here. Some of you are. But there's a lot of faces that were not here 12 years ago. And that's beautiful. And some of those faces are in heaven with the Lord, and some of those faces have moved. Some of those faces are attending other places. We can't, that can be discouraging sometimes. But when people are called to worship in a church home, that's between them and the Lord. We cannot be in competition with other churches. Let's say that. We cannot be in competition with other churches. If you have a friend that is plugged into another church, plug them, leave them there. <laughs> I mean, right? You don't, we, that's between them and the Lord. Like, if you feel called by the Spirit to say, like, I don't know, maybe, like, but that's a personal, it's not about everybody come and worship with us. We are not in competition with other churches. We are in competition with sin. We are in competition with people being lost and not knowing Jesus. We are in competition with people being hurt by pettiness and by people being disobedient. We are in competition with darkness. And we are the light. I have this imaginary game that I play sometimes. And I think if I were to take some of my people, some of my groups who I know and love, and I put them in a room, like if I were to pick like five or six of my people, and I said, hey, I want you to come here, and you are going to pick your five or six, and they're all in a room, but we're not there. We're not there. We don't get to come. It's just our network. The people that we know and love, they're in a room, but we get to be flies on the wall, right? We get to kind of like voyeuristically see magically through this imaginary game. I 1,000% know that they would have some church, right? They would get along so well. I know that you guys would love Wendy, who I went to college with. Like, she's just a doll. Like, and I haven't been in a room with Wendy in probably 30 years. But sometimes we'll Facebook Messenger talk, but I forget sometimes that you don't know my people. I just assume you know them. But Jesus knows them, right? I am not the most in part, important part of that relationship. The connection between me and these other people, and then you and your people, we are not the important part of that connection. Jesus is, right? Jesus, God is the thing that is connecting us all. I was raised in a Baptist church. I worked at a free Methodist church. I attended an Arminian university, a diverse seminary, and now this is a non-denominational church, and I don't really care about any of those labels. Um, I'll tell you the word that I do love. Ecumenical. Ecumenical means representing a number of different Christian churches. Heaven is going to be ecumenical. Heaven is going to be unified. And isn't that what we pray in the Lord's Prayer? On earth as it is in heaven. Just last week, something was announced that's coming in 2025. 
Gather 25 is going to take place on March 1st of 2025. And because of technology, we will be able to be part of something. We, the global church, not necessarily like, but I think we should potentially look into this. But um, there's a simulcast that will happen across the um, every continent on the globe. It's going to be, you can go to the next slide. It's going to be 25 hours of prayer for the church to reach the ends of the earth. There's approximately 8 billion people on the planet. 5.5 billion of them do not know Jesus. So if Paul's mission was to evangelize the Gentiles, we have come a long way, but there is still work for the church and the network to do. See, the tree graphic has roots, but what about leaves? What grows because of the roots? The people in your who are the people in your life that are impacted by you? Who are the people around you that need to see Jesus in your life, that need to hear about the grace that He offers? And Gather 25 is about that. It's a movement that was spearheaded by Jenny Allen. Um, she started the It Gathering. They have the support of Uversion, Barna Research Institute, the Global Alliance, Crew, which used to be Campus Crusade, Convoy of Hope, Right Now Media, The Bible Project, Global Advance, Arise Asia, Lose the Lao Ministry, Solucio Mis Movementos, Behind Bars Prison Ministry, Messenger International, and many, many more. But this is a very ecumenical project that has started. If you go to gather25.com, you can get more information. You can watch the video. But I love this. This gets me excited. To me, this feels like the fungus that is connecting all of us. That says, you know what? We are not just isolated here in the government. We are connected to something so much larger than ourselves. This is the church being united in one vision for one purpose, for one God, that the network and the roots would grow deeper. We're going to close, and what I would love is if we would now um, pray for the churches that are around us. We have a lot of churches in Montgomery, and I'm, I'm always, you know, so encouraged when you see somebody on Facebook Facebook or social media, it's like, oh, I need a great church. And there's so many. Like, we have a lot of strong churches in the area. We're not in competition with them, right? Everybody has a place and everybody can belong. And so, but let's lift them up in prayer. Let's pray for the people that are right now sitting in their services or working in their kids' ministries or in their sound booths and technical places. Um, so, you know, if you have friends that worship at another church, pray for them. If you have family that are attending other churches right now, pray for those churches. Um, pray for the leaders and the missionaries that are making a difference in the global church. The leaders for this Gather 25 network, they have been for the last year every day at 5.50 praying for the 5.5 billion people that do not know Jesus every morning at 5.50 a.m. So, let's pray. Lord, you are the one that is in charge of it all. And you knit us together, and you give us people that are our fellow servants, our fellow workers in Christ. You give us people that are our roots that are the network that we can communicate with across distance. Strengthen us and unify us. Give us that vision that is the same as your vision. Give us the calling and not to lose sight of the fact that we are called to share this good news of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. That is why Paul wrote his letter, is because he was on a mission. Help us to be 
an encouragement to every person that we encounter. Help us to be encouraging to our friends that minister in other churches. Lord, we pray right now for those churches that are in our community. Lord, we pray for the churches that our family attends. Lord, we pray for the pastors, the leadership, the missionaries, the, the ministry leaders, all of those people that you have called to a specific purpose. Lord, we pray for the 5.5 billion people across the globe. And, those, and of that number, Lord, we pray for those people that are right here in our community that we will meet this week that do not know you. Lord, give us opportunity for that to seamlessly part of our conversations this week, that we would be able to express to other people how deep and far and wide the love of Jesus is. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you for letting me share with you this morning.